So, kind of the icebreaker question is, what keeps you up at night? Huh. Um. Hi everyone, well today I want to share with you a video of an interview that I did a year ago in September 2019, so this is pre-pandemic, of the architect and professor Liam Young. Now if you're not familiar with Liam Young, he's a super interesting person because he calls himself a speculative architect. He doesn't really design buildings and stuff as we would expect as a traditional architect. But he actually, what he does is he visualizes with current technology that we have today, possible alternative futures of our city. And they sometimes can be sort of mesmerizing or can be actually quite scary. So in a way you can think about Liam as a sort of a scriptwriter of a black mirror for our cities. If you're not familiar with him, look up all the interviews that he has online and all the presentations he has online. They're, they're sort of like performances. They're super interesting. He has a lot of TED Talks and design talks. So definitely look him up. Uh, I met Liam in 2018 when I was doing my master's at SciArc, where he leads the master's program for the fiction entertainment program, which is super interesting. And if you're into storytelling or if you're into animation or actually if you're in design but are really interested in filmmaking, it's a program that you should check out. So I leave you here with the interview. The interview was done at the symposium for the UR University in Monterrey, Mexico, which is my hometown. The audio is not great because there was a lot of background noise. I tried to fix them up as much as possible, but I think the conversation makes up in the end for the bad audio. And I did add some subtitles and some interesting images to go along with what Liam is talking about. So I hope you enjoy it. And if you like this and want to see more videos like this, please do like and subscribe. Thank you. So, kind of the icebreaker question is, what keeps you up at night? Huh. Um, what are your preoccupations? Yeah, I mean, I spend most of my most of my work is interested in trying to articulate and tell stories of what I call the other future. Um, so, I guess the frustrating thing about all these technologies that we're told are going to be part of our future cities are that they're only marketed to us in very particular and narrow ways. You know, they're, they're sold to us as technologies that are going to make our lives better. As I said on stage, they're going to give us better orgasms, they're going to connect us better to our friends, they're going to make our lives more efficient. Um, uh, but we rarely talk about the complications um, and the diverse um, critical narratives around these technologies. Um, we rarely talk about the cultural implications of these technologies. In most cases, we're sold technology as opposed to being introduced to it in a way that we can actually start to really examine it for what it might mean for us. Um, so the frustrating thing, I guess the thing that keeps me awake at night is this very singular and simplified way through which we talk about urban technologies. Um, so in my work, I try and um, visualize and articulate and narrate all of the other futures that are actually produced um, at the same time as these um, marketed Silicon Valley um, preaching futures. Um, so, you know, you, I, I, you can't talk about, um, as I said, you can't talk about green energy and solar-powered cities without talking about batteries and where batteries come from. You can't talk about the driverless car without talking about um, the displacement of jobs, without talking about how the street will be fundamentally changed by those forms of autonomous infrastructure. You can't talk about, um, you know, a, a, a smart city system managed um, based on big data without talking about privacy and surveillance. You can't talk about drones without talking about um, uh, regulation and um, uh, yeah, the, the, all the problems that come with remote operating. Um, so we try and narrate and visualize these alternative futures, or what I describe as the other future of our technology. So we are we are appropriating the simple packaged sales pitch and making that our reality without actually mm -hmm. looking at all the related issues yeah. around this. I right? think I think the issue is that. If we think about the smart city, um, uh, uh, the key question is, are, are we customers of that city or are we citizens of that city? Um, and at the moment, our technology arrives to us not because it's going to make our lives better, but because it can be sold and because someone thinks we might buy into it. Um, and I guess I'm trying to um, think about and, and produce work 
that's trying to empower the public to be more active consumers of technology rather than just passively, passively waiting in line for the next iPhone to be released. Um, so that's, um, I think, where we're at with smart city technologies. I'm not afraid of this stuff. I'm not advocating that we retreat to the hills and raise chickens and pigs and, and go back to some Luddite version or, or pre-tech version of civilization. I'm just saying that we need to be smarter about how we choose to let these things enter into our lives. Right. Um, because actually they're really significant changes that, are, that, that they're setting in motion. If we think about the smart city, um, what actually is happening is that a lot of the, the, the systems of management that used to be the domain of a democratically elected government are now being outsourced to proprietary algorithms and software companies. Um, that's a fundamental shift in the power structure of cities. Um, and we're not really talking about that. Yeah. Um, uh, for the sake of a bus arriving on time, we're giving up um, huge parts of the traditional democratic process of city governance. Um, that's not a small thing. Um, how can we start to make work and... Um, redesign cities that acknowledge um, things like public code databases or um, kind of shared autonomous infrastructure or ground up community led technological systems as opposed to um, you know a government just outsourcing it to, to, the, to the lowest bidder technology company. You touched upon a few points that I have here in the other questions so they kind of tie in. Mm. Talking about the countryside and not going to like a, a Luddite antique mm. Uh, way of life that you're not you're not advocating for that but I think there's evidence of that happening in some parts of the world mm -hmm. the Japanese mm -hmm. migration back to the countryside that has to do sure. with uh, uh, dissatisfaction with the, with the production of living in the city and mm -hmm. how it works do you do you see that not that you're advocating it but do you see that becoming more and more and will the countryside become this digital detox where actually we're protecting the countryside from technology yeah I mean uh there are a couple of aspects to that question. Firstly, um, I, I think one of the real dangers is that there is this kind of counter-reaction to technology which denies its, its extraordinary power and wonder. Um, so I don't think the solution is, is like, you know, going back to a form of urban farming and growing our own, our own tomatoes and um, retreating from tech. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. We're not going to give these things up. Um, there's a lot of talk now about you know the the, great, the the massive energy footprint of data centers, but but those same data centers allowed us to create the climate models that help us to understand their own impact. Right, like like denying the extraordinary potential of these technologies is just as damaging. Um, as fully embracing them. So I think really we should be thinking about what technologies do we want in our lives and how do we start to roll them out in a way that's regulated and productive. Um, um, the second part of your question is, like, will the country become some kind of digital detox? Um, I guess my point is that there is no countryside anymore at all. That actually... Um, this, this opposition between city and country that we've lived with for so long is now totally eradicated. Um, where every inch of our, of our world is um, designed and manufactured by and through technology. Like what we think of as being countryside is actually um, a highly engineered landscape of production. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time um, traveling to these distant landscapes which are a result of technology they seem empty but actually they're either landscapes that have produced that have produced technology or landscapes that are produced by technology the countryside is actually a large-scale um, uh, designed uh, garden um, uh, you know open um, you know, massive mine sites um, now fill the countryside. Huge kind of automated agricultural sites now populate these areas that used to be the domain of the farmer or the rural worker. Um, uh, 
uh, you know, our countryside is just as um, supported by and filled with technology as our cities are. Um, it's just not as visible. Um, so this idea that we can somehow escape technology is a total fallacy. Um, uh, there is no escape. We've totally re-engineered the entire planet based around technology. Um, it is what it is. That's an incredible way of seeing it. It's basically our back garden that, that feeds the city in a way. Yeah. Um, tying this back into Latin America and the, the Latin American context in Mexico, there's countries that have leap, leapfrog technology. There's yep. many or there's continents that have leapfrog technology. Yep. Um, do you see any leapfrogging in Latin America? Um, is there any countries out there that are interested in leapfrogging what do you, the what do you smart mean by city? Leapfrogging? Avoid the smart city by, oh, by right. itself. So, so like in, in some African countries, they skip landlines directly to cell phones because it took right, too right, long right, right, to install right. landlines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, my, my perception of South American cities, Latin American cities, whatever we're describing, or the it, slow appropriation um, of these things. Uh, like, maybe uh, I, I don't know enough of this context, but I don't see that that Latin America is any slower in the soak up of these technologies than than North American cities. Like, actually, there seems to be more resistance in parts of North America than there is in Latin America to a lot of this tech. Um, because so much of this resistance, as I'm trying to describe, is actually born from a form of ignorance. Um, so, I actually think that the way that um, uh, Latin American technology is being called, like, like technology is being appropriated in Latin American countries is really interesting and exciting. Um, and to a certain extent, um, uh, just like we saw in, in countries like Africa, these technologies are being woven into a really complex and rich culture as opposed to overlaying it um, uh, and, forcing it, and, and forcing adaptation. Um, so I actually think there's more problems um, in a city in the middle of America, North America, than there is in, in Latin America. Uh, yeah. uh, finally, uh, to wrap up, you also spoke about power and politics. And if we known as a common base that power in, in our countries, in Latin America, are, and in many parts of the world, are based around power, is based around politics and money, mm -hmm. is there a shift that will detach power from politics and money with technology? And how could that shift either take place or look like? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's... Um, highly optimistic to think that we're going to be able to detach um, power and capital from technology. Um, but I think in many ways what we need to do is, is think about alternative systems through which technology is produced and, um, and um, uh, ad adopted. Um, so I'm interested in things like um, like if we, if we talk about public infrastructure um, in cities like the, the great tradition of public infrastructure of transport networks water, power, things like that how can we use that same mindset to think about technology um, like at the moment kind of cell phone networks aren't really described as public infrastructure systems, they're, they're owned and operated by T-Mobile or, um, or in, um, in, in Mexico we have Carlos Slim and Telefonica, or what, what's Telemex. the... Telemex. Telemex. Um, um, uh, but now most people don't have access to a, a private landline anymore. Um, we all just use our phones. And when um, there's still kind of government infrastructure in um, those kind of networks, when no one is using them, what does that actually mean? Um, so... Public infrastructure and, and, and public governance is, mu is operating at a much slower pace than technology is. Um, and what that means is that private companies are filling that gap um, in time. Um, so you now have essential services which aren't public at all, but are entirely privatised. Um, the internet is not really a public infrastructure. It's an infrastructure managed by four companies. Um, uh, Google, Google, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. Um, uh, so we need to start to 
think about technology as not a luxury, but um, an essential part of everyday life. And we need to engage with it um, in the same way we engage with other essential services like um, healthcare and water and energy. So someone like Elon Musk, um, he presents an image of a solar-powered future city, um, which at one, one, one glance is, is very seductive and attractive, that everyone will have solar cells on their rooftops and he designed the solar tile, which um, powers batteries that exist in your garage and you can be entirely independent from coal burning power stations and the collective infrastructure of energy in a city. And that is fantastic. But at the same time, you go, well, what does it mean if someone can't afford um, uh, that private infrastructure? Yeah. At the same time, you go, well, if, if, if half the population is using Elon Musk's private Tesla system, um, uh, then um, does the government de-invest and stop supporting um, the public infrastructure of energy? And for the people that rely on that public infrastructure because they can't afford a Tesla Powerwall battery, they're caught in the middle and they're totally s screwed. Um, so I think there is existing models for how we can engage in these public infrastructural systems, in, 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 how we can engage technology as a public infrastructural system. And I think that's, that's the kind of shift that needs to happen. Even things like a code, code base that, that all of these systems are actually run on are again proprietary owned by a few companies. Um, those same kind of things would be um, part of the public domain um, in, 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 in historical forms. Um, uh, they, would, they would be um, shared resources, they would be things that everyone had access to. So thinking about like public code, I think is also really important. Um, so it requires a shift from thinking about technology as something that private innovation does and thinking about it as essential services. Um, that's the critical thing. Essential yeah. service, a piece of code, that's a very interesting yeah. way of seeing yeah. it. Yeah.